seems to me that banks are like grapes. You've got to get rid of the rotten ones, otherwise the whole bunch will go bad. These don't look so bad, but you can never be too sure. Governments around the world are considering setting up so-called bad banks, but the idea is being given a cool reception by taxpayers. That's really the last straw. If I have to take on the bank's risks, I'm at a loss for words. It seems to me that it's like going to confession. You admit the sins you've committed in the past, then you just have to say a couple of our fathers, and that's that. If the banks go belly up, it won't help us in the slightest. I'd rather give up some of my taxes, but of course they'll have to take action themselves. They can't just rely on the state. Should the government take on the bank's toxic assets? Rainer Holznagel from the German Taxpayers Association says no. He argues that the state put up a safety net for the banks long ago, but they failed to use it. Only 18 of the 80 billion euros made available to the banks as fresh capital has actually been called on. It looks as though the need is not as great as the banks are trying to tell us every day. Germany's financial center, Frankfurt. Many of the banks here are thought to be lobbying hard for a bad bank. Deutsche Bank is thought to be one of those lobbying. Deutsche declined an interview but said they don't need one. Many banks are remaining silent on the issue, out of fear of upsetting the markets or attracting the wrath of the public. For now, all they say is that they have toxic assets and need a solution. I've come to the Frankfurt School of Finance to discuss what solutions are available. Professor Michel Grote believes a bad bank could be a good idea. But it shouldn't be seen as a waste disposal facility, but as somewhere to park toxic assets and remove them from balance sheets. If you have a toxic asset on your balance sheet, as a bank, you try to sell it. But lots of banks are doing the same thing. So the price of those assets falls further, and other banks have even greater write-downs. So it's an ongoing process of write-downs across the board. That's why there's no fixed value for toxic assets. In a Frankfurt bar, the waiter writes what customers owe onto coasters. They have to pay before leaving. We stop for a drink and pause to think about good and bad banks. The beer coasters are effectively a kind of bond. They oblige the customers to pay their debt at a later point in time. The risk of a defaulting can be halved with a pair of scissors. Now we have two derivatives that can be sold on to two creditors. This essentially is what bankers did millions of times over. That's not allowed. Frankfurt's barkeepers didn't think much of this kind of speculation, and I feel the same right now about banks. I've lost track. And that's where bad banks come in, says one financial consultant who I visit in Hamburg. Jan Erik Kvanstrom from Sweden specializes in bad banks. He managed a bad bank in his own country at the height of Sweden's banking crisis in the 1990s. The bad bank in Sweden uh, called Securum, uh, which were linked to one of the Swedish banks, by the way, it was not a general bad bank, um, got a capital base to be able to survive and stabilize the market, handle the assets, uh, which would last 15 years. Uh, luckily enough, the crisis was over after five years and the market came back. And because people in the bad bank had worked very efficient and very fast, we were also prepared to divest of the assets already after five years. Jan Kvarnström says the banks need a pilot to guide them through the crisis rather than a savior. He proposes several smaller bad banks instead of one big one. Whether German taxpayers like it or not, it looks inevitable that the state will have to come to the rescue. After all, money doesn't grow on trees.